What is up guys, it's me Absolute Habibi and today we have a little bit different type of content. Many of you ask me for guide videos specifically on EU4 multiplayer games and how to get into multiplayer games, how to be a good player in multiplayer games and I thought I should deliver on that request. But instead of just giving guide videos, I thought what if I ask players in the EU4 multiplayer community directly on EU4 and EU4 multiplayer? The question I asked them for this video was what is a tip you would give to a player who is about to play his first multiplayer game? Here was their responses. Always use advisors. If you can't afford at least a 1-1-1, go in a deficit for it and use early wars to fund them. Advisors are a key component of your monarch point generation and if you're not running them, you're gonna fall behind. Be efficient with your monarch points. This is a core mechanic of Europa Universalis in general, but using your Monarch points inefficiently can have way worse consequences in multiplayer. Don't take tech early unless it's an admin tech for ideas, or it's a military tech before, a, uh, before or during a big war. Horde military points, don't use them unless necessary, or you're about to do a big amount of developing. Reroll and Disinherit Kings if they're below 333. Take out all mana points and your estate's privileges in the start of the game immediately. Avoid death pushing institutions if possible. Avoid needless raising of stability. Plus one stability is enough to grow prosperity in your states. And never develop unless you're stacking as much dev cost reduction modifiers you possibly can given your situation. Play meta ideas. In vanilla, the meta for developing is so powerful that nations who do not do it just fall behind in development while the meta nations reach hundreds of thousands of manpower, even breaking the game going over millions and millions of manpower. This is the main reason why many mods for multiplayer change ideas and or nerf developing. Find out what the meta is and stick to it when it comes to ideas. The meta in vanilla is quantity, economic, and quality, then religious or trade. The reality is that there are not enough idea groups or idea combinations that are more impactful in vanilla compared to this meta combination. Get ideas fast. This kind of plays in the last two tips, but completing ideas is very, very important. By 1492 to 1497, you should have your first two idea sets completed. You should also take tech 10 ahead of time and you should always take two military ideas in the first three unless the mod you play on does not allow you to. Vassal feed when you need admin for tech and ideas. Expanding is necessary in multiplayer and in the early stages, if you are not expanding, you're doing something wrong. Early on, you also need admin tech 5, 7, and 10 ASAP as it unlocks ideas and a nation with 3 completed ideas is very powerful. What do you do when you have no admin but want to continue expanding? Well, you don't just not expand, you release vassals and feed them land. Try to annex two vassals at the same time and try to time them to get an X at the same time or within months of each other. You should however avoid excessive vassal feeding later on in the game as diplo points are better than admin points for developing your lands and annexing big vassals can take a long time and cost a lot of diplo points. Don't underestimate players and never treat them as you would an AI, especially when it comes to warfare. Do not expect a player to react and play the same way an AI would. A player is more likely to commit very hard for small or insignificant wars and players are also more likely to backstab and completely ditch you the moment you get declared on. There is a meme in the EU4 community that AI allies are more trustworthy than player allies. This goes into our next tip, don't believe any player or trust them at face value. Instead determine a player's future conduct by asking yourself what would you do in that moment on their country. As I said before, players act much differently to AI and it's hard to predict what a player will do. The best thing a player can do though is try to put themselves in the perspective of that country and think what moves that country may do to expand or improve its country. So if a player is saying they will help you in a war but it doesn't make any sense for them to help you in that war, it might be that they're, they're gonna backstab you or they plan to ditch you. Always have a plan for the next 10 years with points, money, and expansion. Having a plan for your resources and where you're going to expand is always good. The main reason being that you can allocate your resources properly or plan to save up your monarch points and mana, money uh, at the right times. Always be thinking in a 10 year time frame and have a plan. If you see yourself wasting a lot of money that you need for the upcoming workshop or uh, counting house or manufacturing or you have um, a big um, 
idea incoming like quality ideas and you're not saving uh mana then you should probably reevaluate your plan or your resource allocation and when it comes to expansion you need to know uh, for the next 10 years who you have truces with, who you're going to war with. Do you need to prepare for a player war? Um, how hard is that player war going to be, etc. Don't give up after losing one war. Of course, some wars will completely ruin you. But if you do not completely die after one war, which usually is the case if it's past the 1500s, you should keep playing and trying your best to come back since the regional or world diplomacy might shift or you may be able to hit a surprise timing with an event or tech. Giving up on a big nation after one lost war will ruin the dynamic of the lobby and leave a huge void in power. Keep playing and trying. Personally, I've seen multiple times players coming back from one or more lost wars and dominating the region afterwards or even winning the campaign. Be fluid with your diplomacy. So much can be lost by sticking with an ally when it's not in your interest or refusing a deal because you've warred that person before and are still holding a grudge. Don't think about the past when it comes with diplomacy and make alliances and deals that make sense. Staying attached to the same player all game is rarely a good idea except in rare cases such as Portugal and Spain. Additionally, fluid diplomacy leads to a more fun and engaging experience for all players in the lobby. This tip comes from Zlevik himself. Um, he says, compared to single player, multiplayer nation building and diplomacy are very different. In single player, you're usually stacking ways to blob the fastest and uh, be the most efficient, admin efficiency, core cost reduction. Um, and in multiplayer, you're building your nation to be the strongest military power. Um, check out Zlevik's video, 15 tips that will make you a multiplayer god if you want more multiplayer tips from Zlevik himself. Link will be in the description. Drilling is usually not worth it. Full maintenance of troops, especially in the early game, can be detrimental to your growth and stopping you from getting higher level advisors. Provoke any rebels over 50% and then put your troops behind a fort and turn off maintenance. Also, mothball any forts that are not bordering a player while not at war. Just doing these two things, you'll find yourself with more money that you can spend on buildings and better advisors. Avoid going over 100% overextension. 100% overextension means mass rebels spawning and unrest in your nation, giving an optimal time for a player to declare war on you or even truce break you if you just took those lands from them. In the cases where truce breaks are allowed, the player who took 100% overextension might be stuck with the, that overextension since he can't release vassals or core the land while being at war with someone who has core on that land. Avoid doing diplo with players during the week between sessions. Do the, your diplomacy with players uh, before a session or during an ongoing session. Many players play in multiple lobbies or just might not want to talk about the game while not playing the session. Respect this and try to minimize diplomacy to right before sessions or during playtime. Not only that, it will also be fresh in the player's head if you do it before a session. Avoid doing roleplay diplomacy in non-roleplay lobbies. I know you want to get into your nation and get immersed by sending a long essay about how your alliance with Portugal as Spain will be very useful for the next coming centuries, but... Remember that in non-roleplay lobbies, the players aren't really there for the roleplay aspect. They are there to play EU4 and to uh, play EU4 MP. Um, if you want to have a roleplay experience, sign up for a roleplay lobby and avoid using our uh, roleplay lingo and roleplay diplomacy with players in non-roleplay lobbies. Don't be afraid to reach out to other players for advice. Most people in the community are willing to help out new players. Don't be afraid. Many of my best games were after I asked a player how to do the opener and where to expand. Some of the most useful resources to new players are other players. And if you intend to play in a community, a good way to scope how toxic or how enjoyable it's going to be is how willing people are to help you. If you find a community is filled with elitist players who make you feel bad for not knowing something, then you should probably leave that community. And if you are one of those elitist players, you should probably reevaluate your life and move out your mother's basement. This is a map game we're playing after all. Avoid the noob whisper. Getting advice from players is no doubt the best way to improve and learn things. But when it comes to game time, sometimes a player will take advantage of a newer player and DM them bad advice. 
The way to uh, avoid this is try not to take advice from players that are directly next to you in a multiplayer lobby and try to get advice before the lobby from players that have nothing to gain. Like, don't take advice from France as a Burgundy or don't take advice from a Muscovy while you're Lithuania. Don't be afraid to go bankrupt or take loans. That button, that loan button, don't be afraid of it. Sometimes it will be your only friend. In the darkest hour, that loan button will be your only friend. Sometimes the only hope to survive or win is by going into massive amounts of debts. Bankruptcy, though, is not the end of the world, and you shouldn't see it like it's the end of the world. In many of my campaigns, I've bankrupted at least once. Just remember to use all your monarch points before hitting that bankruptcy button, and also make sure that you have truces or at least are safe uh, during your five years of bankruptcy. This one's really simple. Just read the rules, or at least thoroughly skim them. Um, uh, if you don't read the rules, you uh, might accidentally break them. You might have to, you might win a war, but then there's like some war score or province war score uh, rule or something like that. And you'll end up having to give up a lot of land. Just read the rules before you play the game. Used Scorch Earth and know how it works. This comes from a player, uh, one of my favorite MP players and my friend who wishes to stay anonymous. But his biggest advice is use Scorch Earth more. Scorch Earth is a great way to catch an enemy out of position and the delayed reinforcement time will mess up your opponent's reinforcement. However, it's also important to know how it works. In war, you can always Scorch Earth a province whether it belongs to you or not. However, Scorch Earth only impacts enemy movement speed, meaning if you scorch an unoccupied enemy province, you are hurting yourself rather than your opponent. Likewise, if you scorch an unoccupied province that you own, you are hurting yourself. Forts are the best places to scorch Earth. It's a good idea to have a 1k near forts to scorch them just in case of war. Focus on fundamentals of a nation building in warring rather than diplomacy. You probably have heard me or Zlevik say that diplomacy can outdo skill when it comes to survival in EU4 MP lobbies, and this is true. However, if you really want to be a strong player who wins campaigns or gets in the top 3 continuously, focus on building up a strong nation rather than just relying on diplomacy. Not only will you be more impactful player this way, you won't be reliant on other players to survive and thrive. Keep your eye on combat width and make your battle stacks accordingly. When you can afford a full back row of cannons, always have at least one and the amount of infantry you have on your stacks is determined by technology and discipline gap. The later the tech and bigger the discipline gap, the more infantry you will need. By discipline gap, I mean how much discipline difference there is between you and your opponent. Generally, you'll need more troops to win battles against an opponent with more discipline. Late mid game and late game, your battle stacks should be heavily overstacked as cannons will rip apart the front line in the first fire phase if the roll is heavily favored against you. If you have no reinforcements after the first phase, you will end up with cannons in the front line and you will lose the battle right in the beginning. That's why you'll see me or other MP players when it comes to late game, you'll have these huge battle stacks that are double or triple overstacked. Always play for your nation. Your goals and the way you play should be entirely focused on making your nation stronger. Do not get baited into the help me with my war then I'll help you with your war. Don't do that. It usually leads to messy situations and backstabs. Not only that, if the initial war leads to your ally needing to bankrupt or you needing to bankrupt, you won't be expanding for a long time. If you are joining a war, you should have something directly to benefit from it and the amount you commit to the war should be dependent on how much you're going to gain from the war. If you're doing something for another player, you have to also be directly benefiting from it. This also goes back to the noob whispering. If someone is telling you, hey, join my war, or hey, you need to go double your force limit to win this war for me, don't listen to them. And they're probably taking advantage of you. You should be benefiting a lot if you're committing a lot. If you're not going to be benefiting a lot, reevaluate or just get out of the war. Don't be afraid to assault forts. After winning big battles, assaulting key forts can lead to very advantageous positions. This is especially the case when the forts are on rough terrain such as mountains or hills. After the assault in those cases, you can decide whether you can hold or continue pushing forward. But if you decide to hold, you would have a defender's advantage. Sieging the fort after winning a huge battle instead of insulting can give your opponent time to regroup and then attack you on the fort for a favorable position for himself. 
assault the fort, go behind the fort, reinforce your troops. Um, and um, if you're going to uh, uh, assault, make sure you are shift consolidating your troops uh, to minimize losses. Um, uh, also, uh, never assault if you don't have manpower. That should be obvious. But if you don't have a lot of manpower, don't assault. Be humble. Of course, this is something that we all struggle with, uh, even myself. But in multiplayer games, multiplayer players will not care if you world conquest with Ryuku or if you're a high ranked player in another game. In fact, most players appreciate other players who are level headed and humble. Make a good play that won a war, don't spend the next two sessions bragging about it. Lost a fair war really badly, don't complain about it and learn from your mistakes. Try out a colonial nation if you are too nervous to try out multiplayer. Colonies of colonial powers are always played in major multiplayer lobbies. Just sitting for one lobby and listening to what your overlord tells you to do uh, can make you a much stronger player right off the bat. Not only that, you do not have to do any diplomacy and you can solely focus on building up the strongest nation you can. Finding playable lobbies, especially if you live in, um, if you live in Asia or Oceania, can be pretty difficult to find. Um, but a good place to start is my Discord server. Uh, on my Discord server, we play two games. One on Friday, um, 10 a.m. Central Eastern Summertime. Um, and then on Saturdays, the same exact time. Um, and not only that, on my Discord, in the Promotions tab, you'll find multiple promoted multiplayer Discords that have been vetted by either me or a Game Master on the server. So they're servers that we recommend to other people. All of these are resources that you can use to find lobbies and you can even ask people, talk to people, and they will give you the invites to the more, quote, ex exclusive lobbies. Did you like this type of video? Is there another question you want me to ask you for multiplayer players? If so, let me know down below. If you are new to my channel, check out my playlist page where you can find all my series in one place. All my EU4 series, Hoi4, whatever, all in one place. Um, also, um, if you would like to directly support m my channel, my YouTube channel, you can check me out on Twitch. Uh, right now, we have a donation goal to get a new camera, which is not only for the Twitch, but also for the YouTube. Because it's uh, not only will it be a double as a webcam, but it will also be uh, a camera I can use for videos. So definitely check that out. Um, that's it for this video, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.